On today's episode of the Locked On Texan Podcast, we hear from Cole Thompson, Sports Illustrated's own Texan and Texas A&M beat reporter. That'll be a very interesting conversation. And why James Bradbury to the Houston Texans could or couldn't work. We'll dive into that on today's episode. Cody, start the countdown. You are Locked On Texans, your daily Houston Texans podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome, everybody, to a Tuesday edition of the Locked On Texan Podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Of course, we are your team every day. And I'm John, some sports guy, here, joined by Cody Davis of the Sports Illustrated franchise covering the Houston, Texas, and possibly, no, we'll keep that on the rocks, Cody, right there. But <laughs> today's episode is brought to you by Bet Online. Bet Online has you covered this season with more props, odds, and lines than ever before. Bet online is where the game starts. And Cody, for today, we're going to have a great conversation with Cole Thompson, a colleague over at, excuse me, Sports Illustrated. He covers the Houston Texans. He also covers the Texas A&M Aggies. Right? So we're going to <laughs> go ahead and, and thumbs down that and horns up over here. But Cody, James Bradbury, let's get right into it. James Bradbury released by the New York Giants um, after failing to meet any trade partners and, you know, trying to get something back for him, a, a talented player who was a pro bowler in 2020. Uh, according to Aaron Wilson, if I'm not mistaken, the Houston Texans and James Bradbury, um, they well, the Houston Texans and the New York Giants, rather, tried to bring James Bradbury here to Houston. Didn't work out. Now we're sitting at a situation where the question is, should Houston now pursue him? You already wanted him when he was under contract. He was due to make $10.1 million. You'll be able to get that for, at a cheap price. You go ahead and say, hey, James, you see interested to come to the greatest city in the country? Come on down to the H-Town. Let's put you in this red, white, and blue. We're going to see what it do. Carl, what do you feel about James Bradbury here in Houston? I like it. I would not be opposed to it. Because first and foremost, I'm looking at it from a standpoint, John, listeners and viewers, you guys should know me by now. Outside of me wanting to see the Houston Texans improve in the backfield, I've really wanted to see the Houston Texans really improve that secondary. And they got a good start on it. You go out and draft Derek Stanley, you go out and get Jalen Petra, and this Houston Texans secondary is going to be better in 2022. But if you could go out and get a guy in James who can actually be a valuable piece in this Texans secondary, I do not see why not. Because first and foremost, you're looking at it from a situation where he's going to be this team number two cornerback. And John, if you remember last week when we talked about the departure of Lonnie Johnson Jr., even though it was a long shot in Johnson's case, that was my biggest concern. Who was going to step up and be this team's number, number two cornerback for the 2022 season? You bring in a guy like James, I think that competition will cease. But two and most importantly, I think it will also give Derek Stingley an opportunity to pair him with a veteran player that can actually help him succeed and help him reach his full potential as being a star cornerback in this league now ladies and gentlemen i know some of you guys might hear that and think to yourselves well why is it so important for stingley to pair himself with a veteran like james well first and foremost if you have not done so please be sure to check out the interview i did a couple weeks ago with jerry rice he came on this podcast and talked about how important it was for these rookies to pair themselves with a veteran at their position in order to reach their full potential. He did it in 1985 as a member of the San Francisco 49ers. And we all know Jerry Rice ended up being one of, if not the greatest player that this league have ever seen. When you take a look at the Houston Texans in 2022, when you take a look at the potential in terms of a guy like Kenyon Green, he has not one but two veterans on that offensive line in Titus Howard and Laramie Tonso, you take a look at John Mechie, who has a veteran, and Brandon Cooks. Those guys are going to be very beneficial to their success. So 
In terms of Derrick Stanley, yes, I understand he has Derrick King. Yes, I understand he has Tavier Thomas. But if you pair him alongside James, that's going to work wonders for his career. And you know what? I want to mention that. I want to point out and mention that you know, it's a reason why the New York Giants couldn't find a trade partner. But we're no longer discussing Houston as a trade partner. We're now discussing mm -hmm. as them kind of in the free agency pool, right? Where you still have Odell available. You still have Julio Jones. Like you still have players out there in the free agency pool. And that's how we are discussing the Houston Texans. Listen, if this was a part of the trade discussion, when you look at 2024 touchdowns, Pro Bowl of that year, had an amazing year. I want to say he uh, allowed the fewest passing yards in his career compared to 2021, eight touchdowns. The most passing yards allowed in his career with 848. The most of the, the the highest passer rating allowed in his career, 93, 61.7 completion percentage. The most targets since his rookie year in his career. You would look at that and say for $10.1 million, I wouldn't touch that with a 15-foot pole, right? But now for Houston, it's all upside. It's all boomer bust, and you can control his market if you reach out and say, well, this is what we want to you know, provide you with. I'm going to offer you this much money. It won't be 10.1. And then now you play in a situation where, kind of like how Nick Casario did last year. If we bring in the player and he works out, good. We're going to keep him. We're going to invest in that player. Hey, you do good here and fit our culture. We may go ahead and re-sign you to a two-year deal, keep you here in town. Or if not, we can just cut our losses, right? And I think that's why James Bradbury is so interesting for the Houston Texans. This is no longer a conversation surrounding being traded now it's a conversation of so we just pick up the phone and say we're interested in you listen what we have we have a Derek Stingley we have a, a backfield or the a defensive backfield that includes a young Jalen Petrie right and, and overall if you make that call you look at what you also have for the rest on the rest of your roster Xavier Thomas Tremont Smith Desmond King Steven Nelson all of these players at that cornerback position that you can utilize in different situations that may actually help you pull the best potential out of your athletes on the field, on your roster, right? And so, you know, I'm not totally against bringing in James Bradbury because I do think he has potential with talent around him to be the version of him that he was in 2020, only because we're not taking on a contract. We're not looking to extend him, right? He was already going to be a free agent after this next season. I think Houston would be able to be in a situation where they are controlling their own destiny with Bradbury. And, again, guys, he was a pro bowler just 12 months ago, right? And so 12 or 14 months ago, he can play football in this league. Don't get me wrong. No doubt about that. But, John, let me ask you this question before moving on. In terms of James – Two and most important, of course, taking Stingley out of this equation. Do you or do you not feel like he'll be the second best cornerback on this team? And how much do you feel his production, his decline in his production, was just due to the fact that the New York Giants was nothing but a dumpster fire this whole entire season? And that's very important because on yesterday, we had an opportunity to talk to Cal McNair, to talk to Nick, Nick Asirio, and both of those guys came out and said, look, the atmosphere surrounding the Houston Texans in 2022 is a complete 180 from the nonsense and the shenanigans that they had to go through over the last 24 months. Yeah, uh, first of all, I don't care what the atmosphere is right now. I, mean, I do care. <laughs> I, you know, I care. It was draft week. You know, the draft is going on. It's amazing. The fans are back outside, and COVID is no longer existing. I get it. But the real atmosphere in culture is, hey, can we put some doves on the board? And we'll get to that mm -hmm. later in the week where we have our conversation around reality, the reality stone, and, you know, what really can happen with the uh, Houston Texans. But I think no doubt about it, he'd be your, your second best corner. Uh, I think Tavier Thomas is a player that a lot of people like a lot and, and, and that's great. Right, but yeah, I think he will be the, the, the best corner as long as he's healthy. Uh, he has the highest potential. I think he may be immediately the most talented of the bunch, which is great. Uh, but overall, yeah, and, and I like Bradbury, he's a player that you know plays 100% of your snaps, right? He can play some special teams at time if need be. So, 
he, he's a player that, I mean, he can go out there and get it done. I just have a worry with when I'm looking at his stats from last year, 10 targets in the game, 10 targets in the game, 16 targets in the game. And those targets, 83 completion percentage, uh, 62 on the 16 targets a game, 80% again on the completion percentage. We see over 50 completion percentages at least 10 times on this list, right? And so that's pretty high. Uh, but, but again, you know, I, I think the situation around him wasn't as favorable. But boomer bust potential, I think you take. I think you can take a chance on a player like that when you're only going to invest, you know, a couple million, right? A couple mm-hmm. million dollars, no biggie. We do that. We got it that in our sleep. Well, he's 28 years old, so if Nick Casario takes a chance and he exceeds expectation, they got their duo in that cornerback position for years to come. Well, I wouldn't say years to come, but maybe for a couple of years, we'll see how that turns out. Our, our partners at BetOnline continue to be the number one source for all of your betting needs and sports information. Find all the latest odds and sports developments, including this year's basketball playoffs, MLB scores, fights, and even next season's NLF futures. Hmm. BetOnline is your continued source for all of your sporting wagering information from live betting to playoffs, esports, and much more. Head to the website today or use your mobile device to learn more about the trends and actions over at BetOnline because BetOnline is where the game starts. All righty, ladies and gentlemen, continuing here with this latest installment of Locked on Texans. I am so happy to finally have an opportunity to have my colleague, Mr. Cole Thomas, um, Texans beat reporter over at SI along with myself. He also covers the SEC. And ladies and gentlemen, as we all know, the Houston Texans, Nick Casario, their 2022 draft class, they went heavy in that conference. Cole, before we get into everything, how are you doing today, man? Pretty well. Uh, finally caught up on sleep, which is something that I think we all <laughs> could say during draft week, especially if you covered a conference or a beat. Mm-hmm. I have none of that. In fact, <laughs> had more time awake at the stadium than you did sleeping in your own bed. For, for yes, three sir. Seconds. Yeah, it was it was a fun time. <laughs> yes, sir, and I can attest to that as well. But Cole, let's jump right into it. Six of the nine draftees that the Houston Texans drafted throughout the 2022 NFL draft, um, they came from a conference, like I mentioned, that you are covering along with the Houston Texans, which is the SEC. Cole, why do you believe the Houston Texans went so heavy in that conference? You know, I think there's two reasons. Let's start off with number one, the experience. A lot of these guys that you're seeing in this conference are going up against semi-professional athletes, or according to what they said. Uh, Damian Pierce, the running back out of Florida, probably said it best. This is the closest you're going to get to the NFL as possible, to where even the mediocre guys still are very stable and would be starters in other conferences. So when you hear something along the lines of that, you know that you're getting the best of the bunch in terms of talent and in terms of recruiting. These are players that are transforming into high-end profile products. And the other thing is that they have high-profile coaches. So even the lesser-known coaches, such as Clark Lee, comes from Notre Dame, which was, at the time, when he was hired by Vanderbilt, the number one defense in the country. Frank uh, Shane Beamer comes from Beamer Ball. You know, Frank Beamer and and the colleagues of what we've seen. Josh Heupel has been around major programs such as Oklahoma and UCF and found ways to win there to where he goes to Tennessee, and he's kept Tennessee competitive in year one. And last season... All but one team made a bowl game. So when you look at 13 teams inside the SEC making it to the final showdown, finishing at least 6-6 and or better, it shows the level of competition. Number two, the experience. A lot of the players that Nick Casario drafted weren't just guys who were, you know, one-year wonders. They had experience. They had been on rosters, and they had been capable starters for multiple years. Derek Stingley, three-year starter at LSU. Kenyon Green, three-year starter at Texas A&M. Uh, John Mechie, two-year starter at Alabama. Christian Harris, three-year starter at Alabama. Uh, Even Austin Deckless, the sixth-round pick, four-year starter at LSU on the offensive line. So when you look at what they went after, they got guys who they know not only could be effective in the long term, but also could be effective right away if you need to start them in the pinch. They've gone up against first-round level talent in college. They've also played a lot of snaps in college to where they should transition without many concerns or questions. And... They also had the experience of playing up against high-end potential. Nick Casario understands that after going 4-13 and last year and finally having a first 
This year, two first-round picks. You have to go ahead and build for your future, but you also have to get immediate contributors. It does feel like of the nine selections, the six that were selected from the SEC maybe are a little bit more adaptable and potentially even frontline starters week one on this new roster. Cool, cool, cool. Um, other than going by player by player, let's go by school for school, starting with a team that you actually cover basically on a daily basis along with the Houston Texans, which is um, Texas A&M. So with that being said, the selection of Kenyon Green, how much do you think the Houston Texans offensive line would benefit from that selection? Extensively. I, I, I really do. I think a lot of people are sitting out there wondering, well, why would you do it this way? Why would you say that, you know, that, that the Texans would have this style of offense? Kenyon Green is a two-time All-American as an interior offensive lineman, and he's played both guard positions with over 17, I mean, with at least 18 games. He's played both tackle positions with at least five games. And during his time at the AM Pro Day, teams were actually asking him to work as a representative on the center. So he's played at least snaps or work snaps at all five different positions. So that's something that you have to look at. But he's a really good run blocker, and that's something that Houston needed to get a lot better at was the run protection. And even though you do want to have good pass Pro. If you're a team that is going to try to utilize the run game to your best ability, you have to be able to focalize on that offensive line. Kenyon Green worked with the back-to-back 1,000-yard rusher in Isaiah Spiller and Devon A. Chain, the speedster who's going to be a high-profile name to watch for in 2023, was a very effective player from the outside. He also did a really nice job of pulling, and he did a very extensive job with lower body strength. The one thing I think he needs to work on more than anything else is hands placement. And when he goes into his break, coming out in pass protection, having his footwork a little bit better. But overall, I thought the Texans need to go ahead and upgrade their interior offensive line. I thought Green was a little bit of a reach, but they got three picks in return for it. So you add the grade together, it ends up being about a solid B, B plus because of what the potential is and what you got in return. I think he comes in right away and competes for starting left guard. And this allows you to move Titus Mm -hmm. Howard, who has been more effective as a tackle back onto his natural right tackle position. (laughs) Exactly. Um, Switching over to Alabama now. Cole, first off, starting with John Mechie, what do you think he would be able to bring to this wide receiving core? And two, is there a little bit of concern when you take a look at a linebacker like Christian Harris, who from reading the his draft scouting report, it seems like he is Zach Cunningham 2.0. You're talking about a guy who is very physical, who can tackle, who is basically pretty solid at stopping the run. But at the same time, he has some concerns with his pass coverage. So the way that I look at a guy like Christian Harris, let's start there. Uh, my player comp for him was more athletic CJ Mosley. So what he does is he's really good against the run. Does he get better in coverage? But the good news is with him is that he is versatile enough. He's also played in a system to where he's had to work a one-man kind of gap situation. Where in this system where he would be playing the Mike linebacker in a 4-3 formation instead of 3-4, it would be a little bit more effective for him to kind of have a limited role. He wouldn't be worrying about certain zones. He'd be worrying more so about one broad spectrum. And then then it allows you to have the safety kind of role behind him. I think that the, those are some concerns. Uh, Bobby Okurake, who's played the Indianapolis Colts, is another guy that I really saw a lot in him, using his athletic abilities first to make up for the limitations he has in coverage, which he's slowly transitioned to a very quality number two linebacker. And when you look at the Texans right now, linebacker may be one of their strengths defensively. I mean, they brought back Kamu Guja Hill. They brought back Christian Kirksey. They have Garrett Wallace still on the roster. They traded for Blake Cashman. They added Jalen Reeves Maven, a really good strong side, uh, strong side linebacker for the Detroit Lions. So it does feel like you don't need to rush this kid in if he's not ready to perform up to speed when it comes to coverage. Now, John Mechie. His role in this offense can be very similar to a guy that people are giving me a lot of slack for, but if you watch the way they play the game, both inside the slot, he reminds me a lot of Juju Smith-Schuster with the Pittsburgh Steelers. Great high-volume catch player. So this is a play, this is a prospect that's going to get anywhere between 75 to 90 catches in a year, probably be effective in the short to intermediate route, so 8 to 12-yard range, and be a little bit effective after the catch. You know, not really great with separation, but really good when it comes to ball control, catch radius, velocity, like all like all the things that you're looking for in a complimentary receiver. And he's going to be able to play inside in the slot, which was a major deficit for Houston last year. Five different players took reps there, none of which found immense success, if we're being completely honest. So if you go ahead and you add him into that conversation, and he can be a Juju Smith-Schuster type guy, 
80 catches, maybe 800 to 900 yards, six touchdowns on the year. It's an effective weapon that you have all across the field. So now you have your vertical option with Brandon Cooks, you have your physical option with Nico Collins, and you have your do-it-all plug-and-play maker with John Mechie. I thought both picks were really smart. And what I really liked about it was Nick Casario said at the very beginning, don't be shocked if we make trades for picks, if the nine picks that we have are not the ones that we have. And guess what? They used those picks that they got from the Kenyan Green deal to go up and get their guy. And that's something that I think is really important is that Casario wanted to go get his guys. These are two players who absolutely fit the mold and fit the criteria of what Casario was looking for in the locker room and on the field production. Before I'm moving on and going down to Florida, I do want to ask you this question really quick. Do you think John Mitchell might have been one of the biggest steals of the draft? Because you're looking at a guy, as I said, when we was doing our day two recap, where if he doesn't tear his ACL, he could have been one of the um, a handful of wide receivers to go in the first round. I think the biggest question would have been, is he going to go after a guy like George Pickens from Georgia or a Sky Moore from Kansas City? Those were two players that also were in that conversation of maybe day two wide receivers take a risk on because of they fit the offense pretty significantly. But you aren't wrong. I mean, I talked to several scouts during the entire draft evaluation process, and they said he's a top 50 player on most boards. Some teams had a first round grade on him. The problem was that the torn ACL did factor in, and he wasn't the team's number one receiver. So keep that in mind because of People were saying, well, what about, you know, a guy like Jamison Williams who tore his ACL a month later? Well, Jamison Williams also was the number one receiver on the team versus the complimentary number two. That also factors in when you have that alpha mentality to where you get a little bit more praise because of the thing that you can do a little bit more. Plus, at his speed, his vertical presence, some teams like that a little bit more than what you want in consistency factor for a, the high-end number two. Ultimately, I think when you look at the two, Williams has the potential to be a number one Bet she has the potential to be a very high-end quality number two receiver to pair alongside with Brandon Cooks for the long-term future. I thought he was going to go probably in the middle middle of the second round, so that was about the right range. Steel's very tricky to say because of you don't know how he's going to come back and rebound from the torn ACL. But if he does, yes, I do believe he would have been that wide receiver that would have been effective right there, especially in that middle of the second round for formation. Summer is coming, and with this summer, you're going to need some food on the go. And listen, Bill Bar are the perfect snacks to take with you on a family vacation. Throw them in your bag or throw them in your kid's backpack. Make sure everyone has a bar so you're fueled for your summer adventures. And the best part about Bill Bar, hey, listen, you get something that's covered. I mean, covered in 100% real chocolate, contains 100, only 130 calories, only four grams of sugar, only four net carbs, Cody, only 17 grams of protein. How can you lose? You can't. Go to build.com, use promo code LOCK15 and get 15% off your order. Again, use promo code LOCK15 for 15% off at built.com. Thanks for making Locked On Texans your first listen every day. Now make Locked On NFL your second listen. The schedule may be dark, but the NFL never stops. You know that. And neither does Locked On NFL. Go ahead and get some insight. Go ahead and get you some opinions from hosts like Ross Jackson, Chris Carter, Tony Wiggins, plus local Locked On NFL hosts repping all 32 teams. There's no off-season for real fans, so make sure you're subscribed to the Locked On NFL on YouTube and wherever you get your podcasts. Going down to the great state of Florida, um, what do you believe the future and the ceiling could be for Damian Pierce? Outside of giving us great content when we speak to him in, with, in, with the media. I'm not sure if he's ever going to be that RB1 1,000-yard rusher, you know, Dalvin Cook 2.0, but he's going to be a very effective kind of guy. I mean, definitely a third-down role player, have a niche on this offense for sure because of the way he uses his body. He's a violent runner that does extremely well between the trenches, but the really impressive part, if you go back and watch some of his games, especially inside the red zone, he's patient behind the line of scrimmage. He allows plays to unfold, and he doesn't rush his body too much forward, so he relies a lot on elusiveness as much as his physicality, and it's very evident in games against South Carolina and games against Alabama. He was making defenders miss behind the line of scrimmage for him to be able to work those extra three yards and get touchdowns. There's a reason why he had 13 touchdowns on the year, because he was very effective behind the line of scrimmage. The other thing about him is he's a very strong and capable pass protector. That's one thing that I think a lot of people throughout the draft process were saying, 
If you're going to be a team that throws the ball early and often, get a guy like Damian Pierce on your roster because he is going to be effective in containing a block. There were two plays out of the Senior Bowl in Mobile, Alabama this past year where, one, he just shucked an outside linebacker. And this is a guy who's about 218 pounds throwing about a 265-pound outside linebacker. And, I mean, it looks effortless. And then they have another one against DeMarco Jackson, who was drafted by the New Orleans Saints. Kind of same formation. Has really good footwork, really good body placement, really good you know, really good control in those kind of aspects. And I love what his, what his capability is when you play him on this roster. So where he can be a good third-down runner, he can get those hard-pressed yards. But more specifically, he can come in and compete for RB1-type roles. I kind of compared him to Jamal Williams with the Detroit Lions, and I kind of think that they're going to utilize him in that same type of offense. They're on third down, inside the red zone, get the hard-pressed yards. And let's be real, Jamal Williams makes a lot of jokes about his anime love and about playing for the Packers. I mean, this. I cannot wait to see what this guy does inside of Houston Media because he gave us a little preview last week, and the Texans PR had to go on mute because they couldn't stop him. <laughs> so, I mean, imagine just being there. For four years. Like, that's exactly what you want for a team that's in the middle of a rebuild. You want to find key players. Yeah. How much better, um, you know, before we switch over and, of course, you know, talk about the two guys that the Texans got from LSU, how much better do you think the Texans' run game will be this season when you take a look at the the, the – player that they got in Kenya Green who excel in run blocking. Of course, you just mentioned the draft selection of Pierce. It can't get much worse. I mean, like, let's just go with that. It can't, it can't get much worse. A franchise low, 3.2 yards per play, eight rushing touchdowns, another franchise low, the lowest in the NFL last year. Only team that did not have a runner with over 500 rushing yards on the team and only had and had a grand total, I believe, of less than 1,500 rushing yards as a whole. It can't, it can't get much worse. Let's just go with that. I mean, it, if it does, there's a <laughs> lot of questions to George Warhawk coming in and fixing this offensive line. Um, I'm not sure that it's going to be, you know, outside the bottom five. I think maybe if you're lucky, you'll get into still the bottom 10, maybe like in like the eighth low, the eighth lowest or the ninth lowest, but mm-hmm. it should be better. I mean, I mean, you do have a really capable run blocker in Kenyon Green, who I do think is, was arguably the best run blocking interior offensive lineman in the class. You get a very hard press physical runner in Damian Pierce. And if Marlon Mack can return back to his perform that we saw in 2019 Ooh. he was with the Indianapolis Colts. That's the kicker. And th- that way you can be complements of each other. And, and the one thing that you got to remember with the Nick Casario ties, the Patriot ties, of course, running back by committee. They love to have versatile running backs who work in certain utilized roles. If Matt can be that in some formations, if Pierce can be that in some formations, you should see significant growth. I would hope that the average is higher than 3.2. I mean, I would say if you're hitting at least 3.9, four yards per play, maybe go from eight touchdowns to 15 touchdowns, that's at least a good spot. Hmm. Now, of course, going to LSU. Of course, that's where the Houston Texans' top draft selection came in Derek Stingley. And then, of course, they closed out the 2022 draft with the selection of Austin Deckler. Um, Cole, what do you think the ceiling for Derek Stingley could be? And we all know the track record. 2019, you're looking at a guy who was without a doubt the best defensive back in the last two years was a little bit shaky more so due to injury but going into the season looking at the selection knowing what the houston texans were missing in their secondary what do you think the ceiling for stingley could be not just for his rookie season but in terms of his entire career i think that stefan gilmore is the player cop that i gave him i think that the ceiling could be Jalen Ramsey. i really do wow I mean, that's The kid was 17 years old, supposed to go to his high school graduation, and Dave Aranda called his dad and said, hey, can he come fly down to Arizona and help us get ready for the – I mean, get ready for the Fiesta Bowl. And in that game and in those meetings and in that formation, you watched how he was able to blanket at 17 years old Jamar Chase and Justin Jefferson, the two biggest rising stars at the wide receiver position in the NFL right now are Jamar Chase and Justin Jefferson. So when you add all that together, and when you look at what they're able to, what they were able to do, and for him to be able to go against them in practice, plus to be able to come right in as an 18 year old and become a a Jim Thorpe finalist, an all American right out the gate in the SEC, and then become a two time all SEC defensive player of the year. Cause that's what he was when he was there in 2019 and 2020, I mean, in uh, 2019 and 2020, he was effective. The injuries aside, 
people said that this was the number one overall defensive player in the draft. Like, like plain and simple. Not defensive back, not de- defensive player. Number one, when fully healthy. There were multiple, uh, multiple big boards with the injuries aside. Still had him as cornerback number one. And I do think that when you look at Lovey Smith and the way that they're going to run the defense underneath him, it's very zone. And I think between him and Sauce, Sauce is better in man. And Stingley's better in zone. So I think that the adaptability is going to become a lot easier. The transition from college to the pros is going to become a lot more effective because of he's already very well-versed in the style of defense. And I think that the level is there. I mean, again, health is the biggest concern. But if the health does work, he's in for a very, very, very exciting time with Houston and has the capability of being a 12, 13, 14-year shutdown corner in this defense. Mm. And, you know... I think the long-term view of Stingley, we all know he's going to be a stud like you just mentioned. But as of right now, when you take a look at what should we expect from him going into his rookie season, um, I'm pretty sure you already saw the draft video, Lovey Smith giving him the call saying the plan is for him to guard every team's um, top wide receiver. I think he can live up to that, but do you think it might be a little bit too soon to hail Stingley as cornerback number one, only considering not – you know, his talent, but only considering the fact that this is a guy who only played three games last year and he's still trying to build himself back up after a very serious foot injury last year. Well, let me ask you, Steven Nelson or Derek Stingley in two years, who do you want as your number one corner? <laughs> Stingley. Okay, Derek Stingley or Desmond King, who do you want as your number one corner? Stingley. Derek Stingley or Tavier Thomas, who do you want as your number one corner? Stingley. Might as well get him out there. Might as well get him used to getting those reps against the number ones now. But that way, when he can learn from it and kind of develop in that way, because this is a rebuilding team. I mean, that, mm-hmm. that's okay. I know Nick Casario doesn't say it. Nick Casario doesn't like the word rebuilding. So we'll say phase two of the process. This is what this is this year. Is It's phase two. You have to be able to go ahead and take the lumps. This is a team that at best, I think, can get seven wins. You might as well go ahead and have that mentality to where if he can go up against number one players, if he can go up against number one receivers, if he fails, great. If he doesn't, well, teams get to know. We have to be ready to target number 24. He's going to be out there. He's going to be blanketing our number one guy. Get ready to pass through your number two and number three. Don't even look his direction. So I like it. You know, Dar- Darrell Rivas came from the uh, Big East when he was drafted by the New York Jets, and they said, hey, you're our number one guy right out the gate. And he impressed. I mean, it, the level of competition was not a problem for him. I think that Stingley, because of what he's seen in college, who he's gone up against, I mean, he's faced – People, people continue to say, like, oh, well, you know, he's only faced off against like, – like, Jamar Chase and Justin Jefferson were guys he went up against in practice. And he went up against Devonta Smith. He went up against Henry Ruggs. He went up against Jerry Judy. He went up against um, uh, Keishon Boutte. He went up against all these other receivers that ended up becoming high-profile players in the NFL. And he already has the experience against them. And he shut them down. So if he can do that and transition to the NFL without many concerns, which, in my opinion – I don't know how he does them. Like, like, like that to me is the safer of the two cornerback prospects is because I think he can transition to either defense significantly better than Sauce Gardner. He should be able to come in right away and be the number one cornerback. And so, yeah, if you got to take the lumps this year, I'll take it. I, I will gladly take it if it means in two years from now, he has the lowest shutdown rate in any player in the country. <laughs> Um, what can you what can you share about the draft selection of Austin Deculus? Do you believe he's going to be a guy who's going to come in and actually contribute to the Texans' offensive line this year, or do you think he's more so of a project? He's a project, but he's a very limited project. If that makes sense, a guy who's mm. been in the college level for over five years is definitely you have a short leash. Like they either are going to transition very quickly, or they're just not going to make it work. And Deckless is, in you know, in my opinion, one of the better day three offensive linemen you could have got because of experience. Guy played in 64 total games, which was an LSU record, and he started in 46, predominantly at right tackle. The biggest question is where does he fit in the offensive line? Do you mm-hmm. want to play him at guard? Do you want to play him at tackle? Do you think he's only limited to playing right tackle because of what he did in college? And then what do you make of the Texans' offensive line? Now, if you were to say, oh, we're trading Laramie Tunsil for a first-round pick, we're going to move – um, Titus Howard to left tackle will figure out the right tackle later. Then I think right then and there, Charlie Heck and Austin Douglas would battle it out for reps at that position. Yeah. But if you keep Laramie Tunsil and you keep Titus Howard, this is probably your swing tackle. He's probably fighting for reps alongside with Charlie Heck to be the number two option. Should someone get injured? Should someone play different? You're probably going to want to see what he can do inside just in case of an AJ Khan injury or a Kenyon Green injury or, you know, God forbid – Justin Britt gets injured and you don't want to play Jimmy Morrissey. So you have to figure out a way to utilize him. I think that he does make the final 53-man roster. I do think that he has a niche for this team. 
And he said that he looks up to a guy like Andrew Whitworth, who is one of the greatest LSU offensive linemen that we've ever seen. Recently retired as one of the greatest offensive linemen in the last 25 years. If he can get that boost of support from Andrew Whitworth, I think that there's a lot of reasons to be to be hopeful for him in the future. And I do think that there's at least a niche for him on this roster. I'm not sure he'll ever be a starter, but a quality backup that in a pinch you need to play a game or two, maybe that's his case. Maybe I'm completely wrong. Maybe we're all wrong and say a six-round pick ends up being a starter. I mean, a few years ago, Michael Onwewu from Michigan came in as a backup guard and became a pro bowler as a rookie for the New England Patriots. Maybe that's Nick Casario's Michael Onwewu this year. Mm. Last question before we get out of here. When you take a look at this Houston Texans draft class as a whole, what grade would you give it? I gave it an A-. minus. I, I did. Um, I also am like Nick Casario. I don't like giving out grades personally because <laughs> – in three years from now, Stingley could be an all-pro and Jalen Peacher could be off the roster. Uh, mm-hmm. John Lux could be a pro bowler and Christian Harris could have been traded. Like, So we got to take all those things into consideration. But they addressed every position of need. They were aggressive to go get their guys. And they're getting players who are going to be here for the long-term future and hopefully be the building blocks and the foundation for the next phase of this whole process of what we're looking at. Mechie's a good slot receiver and you got great value for him. Christian Harris is an athletic linebacker and he's what today's game is needing. Jalen Petrie is the ideal defensive back because if he plays a multitude of positions, safety, nickel, Buffalo, um, can play the perimeter, boundary, corner, so he can do a little bit of everything. Stingley has the experience going up against SEC-level receivers. Kenyon Green has the experience going up against SEC defensive linemen. I want everybody out there who's like, oh, well, you know, he's only a guard. Watch him play against Alabama on October 9th of this past year in College Station. Will Anderson, the future number one overall pick, potentially a Houston Texan himself, <laughs> how to go up against Kenyon Green. Kenyon Green allowed one pressure, did not allow a sack, allowed one pressure against that team. And they want to end up they ended up winning the game. So he's versatile enough to play a multitude of positions. Deckless is decorated. Uh, Keegan Quirantano can do a really nice job as a blocking tight end and compares this game to George Kittle coming out of Iowa. So if he can end up being George Kittle, nobody in Houston is going to complain about that. I can tell you that much. Thomas Booker is a really, really effective bull rushing defensive tackle up the middle, and he can be able to probably fight for reps as third down blitzers with Malik Collins, the Texans three tech right now. And there's two guys that made the um, that were undrafted free agents that I think you need to keep a close eye on: Tristan McCollum, the younger brother of uh, Zion McCollum. I mean, the twin brother of Zion McCollum from Sam Houston State. Really good cornerback. I think can be effective on the outside. Six foot two has the physicality that you want in a number one boundary corner. And then I love Kobe Harvell Peel out of Oklahoma State. This is a mm. very rangy type safety who just found a way to be at the right place at the right time. Ten interceptions throughout his career during his three years at Oklahoma State. Was an effective blitzer and played the run extremely well at times when he was in the Big 12. And he was an all-Big 12 player. Uh, he was a third-team All-American this past season. So lots to like about that. Texans got better. Let's just get that out of the way. The Texans got better this draft. But every other team in the NFL also got better, and especially in the AFC. I mean, we can just go through here. <laughs> Cleveland got better. Los Angeles got better. Indianapolis got better. New England got um, – well, New England got worse, actually. Buffalo, <laughs> Miami got better. Uh, all these teams got better to where Houston maybe is in the bottom, like, three of the AFC. But seven wins is very plausible. Eight wins feels like a reach if Davis Mills can get to the full potential. But at the same time, you're looking for stability at these positions. That's what you're trying to get. You're not trying to get an overanalyzation of like certain but You're looking for stability. And if you can get that for the long term, that's the key. Is that going into 2023, when Nick Casario has said, we're going to spend money, we're going to be more effective with our draft picks, you have a foundation in place to where players want to come to Houston. Players need to come to Houston. And more specifically, players have a desire to come to Houston because of the young core foundation that's already in place that could be part of the long-term process. Cole, really quick, where can our listeners follow you at on social media? You can always give me a follow at Mr. Cole Thompson, at Mr. Cole Thompson, name right down there below. And for those of you who love to hear more national stuff, you can hear me on Just Saying It, part of the Sports Map Radio Network, from 3 a.m. to 7 a.m., Monday through Friday, or download the link on the podcast iTunes format. And as always, I'm your host, Cody Davis. Please remember to follow me on Twitter at Cody Davis underscore 24. Once again, that's Cody, C-O-T-Y, D-A-V-I-S underscore 24, along with my co-host, John Hickman. You can follow him on Twitter at John underscore Hickman 12. Until next time, ladies and gentlemen, peace.